Lord. There is victory, there is victory, there is victory in the Lord. There is victory, there is victory, there is victory in the Lord. Thy salvation, salvation, thy salvation in the Lord. Salvation, thy salvation, thy salvation in the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 in his name. Hallelujah, 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 in his name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank God once again for allowing you and I to be in his presence on this day of power. To seek his power, to seek his spirit, to seek his glory. And as we have come and God meet with us, may his name be glorified in our lives today. And we're continuing to read from the book of Romans, chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, starting from verse 18 till the end of the chapter, which is verse 33. Romans chapter 9, verses 18 to 33. And we see here the apostle, this is the letter he wrote the church in Rome, where you're talking of various issues. And this passage, you're talking of God's election. God's election means whom he whom God has called. It's not by your works, it's not by your connections, it's not by your might, it's not by intelligence. When God calls you, God calls you. It has nothing to do with your own efforts. That's the essence of this passage. And verse 18, we read how in verse 17 that God said that for this reason that he raised up Pharaoh, that he may show his power in him and that his name may be glorified in all the earth. So Pharaoh was specifically chosen by God to display his power. That's why he hardened Pharaoh's heart so that Pharaoh refused to allow the children of Israel to go even when he was faced with terrible calamities and plagues. He would constantly refuse and Say no, and God will do another plague. So, in other words, God is the one that has took complete control of the things of this time. Many people believe it's Satan, but it's wrong. Satan is a tool in the hands of God. God is the one that has the final say for your life. Who has the final say? Jehovah has the final say. Who has the final say? Jehovah has the final say. Jehovah come and ride around. Jehovah come and ride around. He makes a way where there is no way. Jehovah has the final say. Very true indeed. So, therefore, it says, He has mercy on whom He has mercy. On whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. Whom he wills, you know, he created us, and he can do with us whatever he wants. See? He can do with us whatever he wants. So some people he will have mercy on them, others he will harden them and make them very, very rebellious. We read last how he said that he, he loved Jacob, but he saw he hated even before they were born. What we are talking about the sovereignty of God. We cannot question him. He has power to do whatever he wants, wherever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants. We cannot question because he made us. See? So whom he will, he hardens. May we not be the obvious of God's hardening. The Exodus 4.21 talks of how he hardens Pharaoh's hearts. So if that is the case, many of you will say, if God has the final say, if God can do whatever he wants with us, then why does he still find faults? That's what many people will question. If indeed God is in full control, he does whatever he wants, then why is he still charging us with rebellion? Why is he still saying that we committed sin? For who has resisted his will? See? That was nobody can resist God's will. Then in that case why becomes a guilty. Because Second Chronicles 20, verse 6. Second Chronicles 20, verse 6. Second Chronicles 20, verse 6. 
plus second for the goals plus 15. That's 6. Okay. Second for the goals. 20 plus 6. 20 plus 6. Yes. And said, mm. O Lord God of our fathers, yes. are you not God in heaven? Mm -hmm. And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of these nations? Yes. And in your hand is there not power and might? Six. So that no one is able to withstand you. Six. No one is able to withstand you. Nobody can resist God's will. You know, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, but eventually he had to give in. So, but indeed, now, this is the reply. That was, who are you to reply against God? If you are questioning God, who can question him? No, he's a, he's a sovereign God. He does what he will, he is. So will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why did you make me like this? Imagine you making like a car, a toy car, or a boat or whatever. And suddenly that boat says, talks to you and says, why are you making me like this? <laughs> you know, would that, would you, do you think that's ever possible? Well, that's what we human beings are saying to God. We are questioning Him. God, why did you make me so thin? God, why did you make me so ugly? Why did you make me so short? Why, why is my nose so big? Hmm? Why am I black? Why, why did I come as a white person? Hmm? But why did I come as uh, uh, a rich American? Why did I have to come in the poorest part of the world? Many of us ask the same questions to God. And it's not fair. We cannot question God. All we have to do is accept whatever He gives us and move on with life. Because He's sovereign. We cannot question Him. That's what sovereignty means. Will the thing form say to him who formed the why have you made me like this? Does the potter have power? Does the potter not have power with the clay to make well, the same lump out of the same lump one vessel for honor? And another for dishonor. Isn't that true? Out of the potter, it makes very beautiful plates or cups, and other things, it makes them less beautiful. So the potter has the final say over what it produces. The thing that's made, the plates or the, uh, the cup or, or, the, or whatever container is made, cannot question the potter. And God is the potter, we are the clay. You see? We cannot question Him. And go to Proverbs 16, verse 4, 2 Timothy 2, 20. Proverbs 16, verse 4, 2, 2 Timothy 2, 20. 2 Timothy 2, 20. Two. Oh. Proverbs 16, verse 4. Proverbs 16, verse 4. The Lord has made all for himself. Yes. Yes, even the wicked for the day of doom. See? 2 Timothy 2, 20 says that but in a great house, there are not only vessels for honor, mm -hmm. see, of gold, there are not vessels for honor, of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. See, it makes gold vessels, makes wood, the same potter. So God can do with us whatever he wants, we cannot question him. But in everything he does, there's a reason for it. He just doesn't do things willingly like us human beings. In fact, God's, the Bible says that everything God made is, was beautiful, was good. Even though the world may think you are ugly or bad, but in God's eyes, you are good. And there's a reason why he made you like that. See? What if God wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering? The vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Now that was just like he did with Pharaoh. You know, he allowed Pharaoh to refuse him so many times. But in the end, he showed his power in his life. There are many people today that are disobeying God in their personal lives. And they think they're getting away with it. But actually they're not. There's coming a day of wrath and destruction on their lives. But they think that, oh, if God wanted to be destroyed by now, would have destroyed me. Yeah. And they continue their rebellion. They are the example that God is wanting to show his wrath and he make his power known in their lives. And he endured with much suffering their rebellion. So he giving them a chance to, rebe uh, to repent. But they wouldn't repent. Mm -hmm. See? First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians 5 9. First Thessalonians 5 9. 
and 1 Peter 2x. 1 Peter 2x says, For thy righteous man dwelling among them, to many is righteous soul, <coughs> day to day, seen and hearing the lawless deeds. Talking of uh, talking of lots. 5-9. 1 Thessalonians 5-9. For God did not appoint us unto wrath. Yes. Hmm. But to obtain salvation yes. through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus. We are not appointed for wrath. We are not the objects of wrath. We are the objects of his mercy. The objects of his wrath are the ones who rebel against him. And the ones like Judas. And the ones like Pharaoh. And he endured, he endures with them to show his power in their lives. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory. See? He will show us his mercy. The riches of his glory will be shown in our lives because we are objects of his mercy. And we've been prepared before the foundations of the world. Prepared for his mercy. Colossians 1 27, Romans 8 28 to 30. And read Romans 8 28 to 30. And it says that. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. That's us. We are the objects of his mercy. For whom he foreknew, I mean he knew us before he came to this earth, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So the fact that you are in church today is not by chance. You have been called from the beginning, you have been predestined to follow Jesus Christ. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, this he also called. Whom he called, this he also glorified. And whom he justified, uh, he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. So, several steps. First, you are predestined, and then you are called, then you are justified, and then you are glorified. We are those people we are referring to there. See? So, they are objects of wrath, they are objects of mercy. God is the one that does everything. As we saw in the case of uh, uh, Esau, where he said he hated Esau and he loved Jacob. What could Esau do? Esau could not have done anything about that. He had no hand in it, even before they were born. Now, it says that even us whom we call, we are the objects of his mercy. Not of the Jews only, but also the Gentiles. So when Jesus Christ came to earth, he opened the door for us Gentiles to come and to receive God's presence and God's glory. Before he came, we had no chance, we had no hope. We were aliens from God's promises, we were outsiders of his, of his covenant. But once he came, he broke open the door and he removed the dividing wall, the barrier between us and Gentiles. That's the law of commandments. He took it away with his blood. And now we Gentiles have the same access as the Jews to God. So in the book of Isaiah, God says, He had given this uh, prophecy that I will call them my people who are not my people, and my beloved who are not beloved. Those are we are the Gentiles. Originally we are not in God's plan. Paul describes us as being grafted onto the olive tree. We are taken from a wild tree in the forest and grafted into the olive tree. You know, olive tree is very precious to God's place olive oil. And so we began to take of the sap of that olive oil, of the blessings we gave us began to take. But we are not the original olive tree. You know, Father Abraham was the original olive tree, and we are taking out of his own, of his own blessings. And so I come to pass in the place where he will say to them, You are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. You see? That verse was given by a prophet who was there. And I was pointing to the fact that we Gentiles are going to be brought in. Into covenant with God, whereas before we were not, and the Jews never even believed it. That's why when Peter was shown the vision um, and he was told to kill and eat, and he refused, God told him, Don't call what are cleansed and clean. And then he went to the house of Cornelius and he preached to them, and Cornelius received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So when he was given this, when the Jews were surprised, but how can you, a Jew, go to the house of a Gentile? So the Jews believe that all the Gentiles are unclean spiritually. Even now, the Jews always live in the same community. They don't mix with the community. They have their own markets. 
they have their own banks, they have their own everything. They do not mix. You know? So when Peter went to the house of Cornelius, they rebuked him, they explained to them what happened. How God had told him not to call them clean. I mean, these animals is had seen the vision. These reptiles, all these terrible snakes. That's how the Jews looked at us. But then God told them, no, these animals which you think are clean and cleanse them, you can eat them. See? Then they should be called the sons of the living God. As I also cried out concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the son of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For we'll finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work on the earth. He's saying that there's going to be another, another holocaust. That's what he's referring to. 1 Samuel 4.21 That only a remnant will be left. Only a little remnant will be left. A remnant will be, will be sanctified, purified to worship God. Book of 1 Samuel 4.21 and he says, we'll finish the work. What work? The work of righteousness. The work of sanctification. God will finish it quickly. But leave himself a remnant to worship him. Remember when um, Elijah cried against Israel and said that I'm the only one left. God says, no, Elijah. I have 7,000 others who are going to bow the knee to Baal. And they are still worshiping me. Okay, 1 Samuel 421. Samuel 421. Then she named the child yes. Hickok, uh -huh. saying, The glory has departed from Israel. Yes. Because the fact of God has been captured. Six. And because of her father in law and her husband. Yes. Now, as I said before, unless the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, would have become like Sodom and Gomorrah. So after the sanctification, after the purification, there's always a seed left. God always leaves himself a remnant to worship him. He doesn't destroy completely. Even when he tries to sanctify and purify us, he leaves himself a seat to honor and worship him. Let's go to Isaiah 1 verse 9, Isaiah 13, 19. Isaiah 1 verse 9, Isaiah 13, 19. Isaiah 13, 19 says, and Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the children's pride, will be as when God overthrows Sodom and Gomorrah. See? It will never be inhabited, but it will be settled from generation to generation. Isaiah 1 9 says, And let the Lord of hosts, hmm. and let us a very small remnant, yes. we will have become like Sodom. Yes. We will have been yes. made like Gomorrah. Do you know what happens in Sodom and Gomorrah? Because of this immorality, sexual immorality, that God rains sulfur and brimstone from heaven onto on the people and destroys the town completely. And Lot's wife, who should have followed her husband to the mountains, looked back. That's why the warning not to look back. And she became a pillar of salt. Because she saw what no human being should have seen. See? As part of the rebellion, even though she was living Sodom and Gomorrah, her heart was still in Sodom and Gomorrah. That's why she turned back. So then, what is the conclusion? What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. In other words, the Gentiles were the outsiders. Those of us we were, we were not Jews. But God brought us in. How? Through the sac sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. We believed in His work. And because of that belief, you and I are now allowed to come to God's presence. Just the same rights as the Jews have. That's why Peter was surprised when he went to preach to the house of Cornelius. And he saw that God baptized Cornelius and his family the same way he baptized them on the day of Pentecost. He said, now I know that God does not have any favorites. Now that we are not special people, this general have already also been admitted. So we got the righteousness. God through faith in Jesus Christ. Although we didn't pursue it through the law like the Jews did. See, the Jews thought that, oh, they had the law and that was it. But then, after Jesus Christ died and the message of the gospel was being preached, God, God purified our hearts and brought us into Himself. It was Romans 4 11. 
Romans 117, 21, 26. Romans 4, 11. Says, um, and he received the sign of circumcision, the seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of those who believe, though they be uncircumcised, that the righteousness might be imputed to them also. So we receive that seal of righteousness because we believe the more of the cross. See, he believed it. So, but I've attained to righteousness, but even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, they, they thought they would get God through obeying the law of Moses. They did not attain to that law. See? So they started it, but they went through it the wrong way. They were following the law of Moses. We followed Jesus, and we got there before them. See? They had not attained to the law of righteousness. Romans 10, 2-4. And it says that, Romans 10, 2-4, I bear them witness that they have a zeal of God, but not a to knowledge, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ, Jesus Christ, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. You see, Christ, when Christ came, he put away the law because he fulfilled the law for us. He said, You follow me, and everything will be done for you. But they said, No, we have to keep on following the law. So they did not get to where they should have gone to. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, you see, but as well, they fell at the stumbling stone. For I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. That's like Lord Jesus Christ. Whosoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So now as you and I have come into God's presence by believing in the work of the cross and what Jesus Christ did at the cross of Calvary. And through that, we are made clean, we are cleansed, we live of our sins, we are justified in God's presence. But if you choose that you want to follow the law of Moses, then you cannot be successful because you, you fall in one other aspect of it. Just pray. Jehovah, Jesus Christ, Lord my God. We thank you for your grace and mercy. I will let your word sink into our hearts today. Give us for salvation by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us accept our election in you. Let us not question you or mom against you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.